a tale of two launches, one sector, two different, two very different demographics and a pandemic. What could go wrong? What could go right? Um, welcome to the Provoke Media Podcast. I'm Arthi Shaw. I'm executive editor for Provoke Media and your host for today's episode, which is also part three of a series that we're doing in partnership with MRA called Modern Brand Belief. As I said at the start, today's show is a tale of two launches specifically automotive launches. And for those of you who know your cars, um, specifically we're talking about the Infiniti QX55 and the Infiniti QX60. So the former QX55 targets single successful men without kids and the QX60 targets professional women who are mothers and have sort of multifaceted and busy lives. What we're going to do today is we're going to deep dive into both of those launches and talk a little bit about how they were really anchored in earned audience-led strategies. So to do that, from Japan, we have Wendy Orthman, who is Global Head of Communications at Infinity. And from New York, we have Stephanie Fries, who is SVP of Public Relations at MRay. Welcome, Stephanie and Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so I, I'm obviously I, I'm obviously really excited about this because I love the fact that this breaks a lot of the expectations that we think of when we think of automotive and, and automotive launches. Um, so Wendy, let, I want to start with you. You know, you, you launched two cars to very, two very different demographics during a lockdown, but not only that, you also moved from Tennessee to Japan. I believe it in March 2020. So let's start with that piece. What, <laughs> tell us, take us on this journey, Wendy. You know, when they announced my job in January of 2020, I thought, oh, this will be great. We'll move to Japan. We'll see the world. Um, and then, uh, yeah, March uh, arrived and we were a few weeks away from um, what we thought was going to be our depart uh, start date, if you will. Uh, initially, I had planned to do the New York Auto Show and stay till mid-April. My family was going to finish the school year husband wrap up his job and and then the rest of the family was going to come in June and then uh, mid-March of 2020 you may recall everything started shutting down um, I started hearing of tales of co-workers um, in Europe who were supposed to get to Japan who were suddenly getting stranded and um, my husband and I the day I got my visa on a Monday um, decided that we needed to move and we needed to move fast just for fear that if we didn't go now we wouldn't make it to Japan so we got our visas, I got my visa, family had tourist visas still. On Monday at 11 o'clock, I called the movers and said, how quickly can you get here? And they said, well, you we could come next week, but that would have put me into April and that made me nervous. So I'm like, anything sooner? She goes, well, how about tomorrow? So, <laughs> so at 11 o'clock on a Monday with like very little other than some general stats of this is gonna go to Japan and this is staying um, in our house. We packed up our entire life um, and Myself, uh, my husband, my two kids, we sold cars, we packed our belongings into storage into what goes to Japan. And by Saturday morning, a canceled flight and a couple other dramatic turns in the mix, we were on a plane to Japan. We made it in with less than 36 hours before they closed the border. And had we not left and sold our life and packed up in five days, we would have been stuck in America with me working through the night until November or later of 2020. So it was the closest to feeling like I was Jason Bourne and like in an <laughs> operation moving my family, smuggling them across borders um, that I've ever come to. And I don't really ever want to do it again, but I'm eternally grateful for the hustle and uh, getting out of the country when we did. because it was like, uh, I mean, I got an adrenal rush just hearing you tell that story. So yes, I, I, um, I, I can't even imagine living that. Um, but you are, you are settled in Japan now. Yes, and um, and Stephanie, just to give our audience a little bit of context around you, so you're sort of, you're sort of a, a PR maven. You've, you're a New Yorker. You've been in the business for, I, I guess, more than a decade at this point. Well, way more than a decade. Very very flattering that you think it's around a decade. Um, the very good skincare that I use. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but yes, and I um, got to meet Wendy as she was telling that story. I met her only mere days before her Jason Bourne move to Japan. And we've gotten to spark a wonderful partnership and friendship um, really remotely during the pandemic um, and really partnering with what she brings, which is this immense expertise 
ways of knowledge in the auto space and the communication space with some of my kind of off the wall thinking of someone who comes not from the auto background and never had really worked in the auto category, but being able to bring um, some uh, new ways of thinking as we think about earning attention and, and telling stories and building narratives for consumers um, and not feeling so one track, but really taking some learnings from other areas, other types of categories that we could really apply to these tales of these two launches. Right. No, I, I love that. And, and, and I think that's so interesting that you have a background that's, you know, beauty and, and, and fashion and, and re retail, you know, lifestyle products. Right. And you were sort of able to apply that to to these automotive launches. So so let's talk a little bit about these launches. So let's so Wendy, I mean, so how did so you got to Japan and were you just you got there and it was like, all right, QX60, let's launch this. Like, like what? Tell us a little bit about sort of how you because I believe the QX60 was the first one to launch, correct? Actually, QX55 was first. Oh, okay. um, uh, no, but that's okay. As you can imagine, we built an entire global team um, in lockdown. So I think it was I had three or four months before I even actually saw any of my coworkers in, in person. Um, but the team assembled, um, some stuck in various countries around the world, others here in Japan, but working remotely, as you can imagine, and then the agency in the US um, so our first project was how do you launch the QX55, which had been scheduled to be a very traditional press conference at the New York Auto Show. So that was scrapped when the New York Show was canceled. And we had to get real creative on how do we build a, a launch moment in the middle of this world that no one has the rules for and where we can't be confident that people could ever actually show up to go see something in person. Um, so thankfully, I'm always someone who loves a good challenge and a creative, um, a brief like that where it's not been done before just gets me very excited. So we had a lot of fun with our agencies and partners coming up with ideas on how we could um, create something memorable. And we really started with both of these launches with the customer, um, which I think is a different strategy than often happens. There's a tradition in the automotive world of very much you have your collection of essential automotive media, and that's who you talk to and you build the program around what they want. Um, and while I think it's super and super important to make sure they have access to executives and all of their information and all of that, I think in the digital world of which we were rapidly becoming brand new experts in, um, there's a real opportunity to take the conversation directly to your customer as well and to both engage in media to have that third party conversation with your customers, but also open a pathway to have that conversation direct. And, and that was really the philosophy that we took into QX55 and the way we did our digital reveal with that. Can I, can I ask a question there? So do you think had we not been in lockdown that you would have taken that same approach or do you think it was quite informed by, by the digital nature of the world? I think getting approval from the powers that be um, to, to do something so non-traditional would have been much more difficult. Not saying it couldn't have been done. I worked for fantastically progressive people, um, but I think it would have been harder because there would have been a lot more temptation to go with the tradition of, but, but is it official unless there was a sea of people looking at it on a stage and the executive got to wear a suit and walk out and stand next to the car at an auto show or a big event. And when you took away that ability, and it became very, um, very possible and easier to, to buy in on this idea of, well, what if we just hired Allo Black and did a concert with Live Nation and then unveiled a car in the middle of a concert um, where anyone could watch, where our retailers and our media and consumers could engage with the experience and we could sprinkle in our executives in, in sort of a cool backstage at the nightclub sort of style um, and build a narrative that we think really would connect with this target customer of stylish, you know, young, um, affluent men who we think would really connect with the QX55. Right. So, you know, and, and I, I'd be curious, so Stephanie, to just sort of hear from your end. So like, you know, because obviously Wendy, you know, she's driving it at, at HQ. So on your end as the agency, sort of how are you sort of plugging in? And, and did you have moments where you thought, wow, this is, this is, um, you know, we've never done anything like this before, or given your background where you came from a, a space where these types of events and, and, and you know, um, having bringing in a big name celebrity and, and launching in that way wasn't as, 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 as new, I guess I should say. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, I never launched a car before. So I was like, this sounds great. Like, let's do it. Um, I think some of my colleagues who have deep, deep roots in the auto industry were like, wow, this is really different, which is when I really early on realized that this was an opportunity for us to really amplify like how we earn attention. And so I think what, what we really want to do is not just you know, kind of say, okay, let's, it, it's a concert reveal and we'll just kind of pitch our auto media where we're like, what types of narratives and stories can we do and how can we show up differently? How can we use this momentum and this platform that we're going to have from the brand and think about where the stories show up? And I think this launch Q55, QX55 and QX50 gave us such rich storytelling that we, Again, me being the newbie was like, this is what we've always done when I've launched brands. But I think for a lot of my coworkers, we're so excited to see the, the types of results and impact that we saw from this, which I think going into it, and I don't know if you agree with this, Wendy, we weren't really sure what it was going to look like on the other side, but we were so I think maybe a little surprised, but so it was so gratifying to see the type of impact that we were able to do with this different type of launch and really leaning into a more modern approach to communications. So I, I want to talk a bit more about impact in just in just a moment, but but I, you know, when I think about a car, right, and buying a car, it, I, I'm oh, I'm, in, I'm put back into the, the sensory experience, right, like you know, when you test drive your car, you smell the leather, and you you know you, you kind of get a sense of, of, of what the what the ride feels like. So, you know, it sounds like with, at least with QX55, you all were sort of able to at least create a, a really sensory experience with this concert, right? I mean, that's, that's I mean, talk about, you know, engaging um, one senses. Were you, how, were you able to replicate something like that for the QX60 launch as well? Yeah, I think we took a lot of the learnings from QX55. Um, the things we thought we did well the first time out, which um, certainly was a challenge for us, was balancing the right amount of, celebrity and entertainment to keep it interesting to customers with enough information and presence from our executives that we felt like we got the corporate messages in there, but in a way that would be palatable to the customer, not just the media who obviously knows who our chairman Payment Cargar is and, and our head of design. Now, if I was thinking about our actual target customer, I'm not sure he or she is going to care who those people are in her day-to-day -day life, but can we can we bring them to him or her in a way that's relevant and, and interesting for her to listen to? And so that was, I think, what we liked best about the strategy for QX55 that we tried to just amplify as we moved into QX55. So you, I, I have to ask a follow-up question to that because it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, when you think about, you know, executive positioning and executive messaging, how did you differ that for, like, what do consumers want to hear from the executives? And we all know what media wants to hear from executives, right? But like, you know, and, and how did you, you know, how did you sort of have those two messages coexist in a world where there really aren't those lines anymore, right? Like where does, you know, when everything's online and everything's accessible to everyone digitally, it's really hard to sort of modulate messages for different audiences. So I'm just curious to know how you all went about doing that. Well, to be totally honest, um, there was a whole piece of the launch that no one saw unless you got the invitation. And that was um, a few days before the reveal film went out to the world, we had round. We had eight hours of roundtables with media around the world directly with our executives. So we got the executive access that that hardcore automotive and business journalists and and the people we needed to see the stories in on embargo in advance with, um, in fairly traditional Zoom based like roundtables with our executives. So they got the quotes from the chairman and they got the quotes from the designers and the things that we felt that they needed for their stories. But knowing that they're going to be writing these stories in advance of the reveal itself. The lift when the embargo happens, we really changed the perspective on what we thought we needed to get out of the reveal film itself and felt like we could have a little more fun and they could show up in a way that was a bit more relevant. So we intentionally had a no suits rule. <laughs> no one was allowed to wear suits um, because if it's a rock concert um, with Aloe Black, you would not show up in a tie. Um, so we tried to we actually filmed our chairman in a bar in the basement bar in Tokyo, which was great at nine in the morning on a Monday, which was funny. Um, so just trying to create atmosphere that we felt m met the moment. So uh, my greatest fear was that we would have this great rock concert and Aloe Black would look amazing. And then our corporate people would look um, like, you know, corporate stiffs. <laughs> I'm like, we can't have that happen. Yes. We have to look equally as cool as the car, as the moment. And so the messages pull through. 
Right. Um, and so that was definitely one of the one of the takeaways and learnings we had for creating this kind of consumer facing um, yeah. reveal. I also thought it was really interesting about sort of balancing, you know, kind of this the celebrity, you know, obviously the paid side of, of the campaign with sort of this earned piece, right? Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, because so just to give again, and, and I'll put links in the show notes, you all, to, to the link to the launches for both QX55 and QX60, because um, there's some context that we're not going to be able to get into all of it. Um, but of course, as you mentioned, Aloe Black for QX55 and then Kate Hudson for QX60. So how did you balance sort of having, you know, what, what was driving the paid versus what was driving the earned? Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Um, I'll let Steph get into a little bit of how we handled tracking lifestyle media and, and how we placed that. But I think that was by far the biggest care point for me um, was just to make sure that we met that balance. Um, because when you walk into finance and you're saying, we're going to launch a car and I need this amount of money to hire a celebrity, I think the first question is, are we just paying them to promote them? Or is that actually going to promote the product? Is that actually going to connect? And yeah. I think shifting to QX60 and Kate Hudson, um, that was a really intentional and strategic choice for us because Kate, uh, what we knew about the target customer, in this case, we call her Claire, um, who we were targeting for QX60, we knew two really important things. One, um, she doesn't really uh, read automotive media, so less than 10% of her reading lists are, or podcast lists are related to automotive, and, and like more than 90% of them don't feel that automotive companies really understand her. And so, well, okay, if that's the case, then it doesn't matter if I can put QX60 on the cover of Car and Driver or Motor Trend, she's never going to know about it. So we needed a way to get in to introduce ourselves, a, a medium, if you will, to like help us bring QX60 to life in her world in a way that she wanted to hear the content. And that's where someone like Kate Hudson, who's a, an accomplished entrepreneur and businesswoman and mother who's very real on her channel and, and will show you know her messy kitchen and, and, and the beautiful chaos of her life in a way that she just commands with so stylishly. We knew she was the right person to really kind of embody that opportunity. Um, so I think that was really the key for us was making sure we kept that in balance um, for both audiences. So when it was pure automotive and business media, we gave them all executives all the time. And then for our digital reveal moment, we tried to find that, um, that way into the customer that would feel more authentic. Yeah, I think also, I mean, we all know it takes a village. So there, there's no just earned world. There's no just paid world. Um, it really does matter a very coordinated approach when we think about launches. But when we thought about from the earned perspective, what you know my agency is tasked with to help partner with Wendy and her team is how could we really create a very coordinated effort of storytelling? And it was very carefully, I think Wendy said it best when there's a lot of things people didn't see that were carefully crafted um, for both of these launches. And I would also say from the paid aspect, the people we decided to partner with, the those moments those paid moments were very authentic. So they were not just like a concert sponsored by Apple, like by Infinity, you know, and Kate, we did a lot of one-to-one -one lifestyle interviews with her and she told a very authentic story of embodying Claire. She is Claire and she drove the car and could understand how this could fit within her busy life. So I think it made it very easy to tell those earned stories when we weren't looking at sponsorship, but kind of a very integrated approach to paid own and earned so uh, uh, so a couple of other follow-up questions here um how so, you know did you all work you know you have your your marquee influencers right you have your your aloe black and you have your your kate hudson did you all also have like second and third maybe tier influencers as well that maybe you know as as, as much as as much as kate hudson probably does embody claire I mean, her, her lifestyle probably is a little different, right, than, than your average um, um, working mom, right? So I, I'm just curious if you all also kind of took that across other levels of, of influencer engagement. Uh, we definitely did that, but I think that waited just a few months until it was time to actually drive the car for the first time, in which case we got very serious about making sure that our drive program, much like the reveal, was equally targeting um, lifestyle media influencers um, that we thought really spoke and embodied Claire and would connect with the kind of content she wants to read um, with making sure that when she's ready to research the car that all of the automotive experts will say, you know, good things. So we had this interesting strategy um, that Steph helped us um, to, to curate 
of, of bringing in um, active lifestyle media. We also intentionally targeted a lot of um, lifestyle influencers who reach um, diverse audiences, um, very specifically making sure that we were represented by Claire in many different, uh, for many different communities. Um, and then we mixed in the middle waves were much more kind of traditional automotive. Um, and it was very interesting that strategy paid off in a couple ways. One was that we were able to get, I think if traditional ride and drive programs, um, you generally uh, get a little bit of social. And then when the embargo lifts, you get this big spike of earned media. That's when the drive impressions can be talked about, everyone launches their stories. Um, by doing this mixed approach, we one, we're not able, not only able to really reach the target customer, but we also were able to get what ended up being 10 days of a program full of social coverage and engagement so that the program real time was being, um, was, was in itself a moment. And then we had the earned push at the end. So it ended up being kind of a one, two punch instead of just waiting for embargo to lift to get the lift of stories. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, so I love, you know, so it sounds like like the, the Kate Hudson piece was quite aspirational, and then there were some of the more quite kind of kind of day to day life um, uh, bloggers, and and also um, the you know the fact that it was sort of this this rolling, um, you, you know, you had a rolling impact, and I, and I want to talk about impact because I know we're running out of time, but before we, I just want to shout out to the fact that you were you looked at Claire through uh, through through. A, a multicultural, it sounds like, lens, and we're mindful of making sure that she spoke to a lot of different communities. And I, I've heard, you know, one of the criticisms we get when, we, when we're going through some of our award entries, for instance, is that that step doesn't always happen. I, it's happening more and more, thankfully. But, you know, that there is sort of this, this default persona, and it's, you know, assumptions are made about that, that that's applicable across all groups. So kudos to you all for, um, for, for thinking um, thoroughly about that. So let's talk about impact. So what was the impact of QX55, QX60? And then, and then we'll close on what are the lessons learned? What are you all gonna carry from those lessons into, into the post, fingers crossed, post pandemic world? Um, but but let's, let's start with the, the, the impact. Let's, what were the results for both of those launches? So I think in both cases, um, we fully uh, succeeded in achieving our KPIs for kind of traditional earned media. Um, we didn't feel that the change in approach sacrificed our um, traditional automotive coverage at all. Um, if anything, we just were able to see a direct amplification then of this opportunity to begin a conversation directly with our customers. So whereas a traditional auto show kind of unveil is going to have maybe at best a few thousand people in a room, it's hard to imagine now, a few thousand people in a room, um, but that would be, you know, every few thousand people and, and likely none of them are buyers um, because they're automotive journalists who have their own, you know, priorities and affiliations. Um, they're not your target customer, um, but you talk to those 2000 people that are at the LA auto show and then, and then the embargo lifts and, and you see the stories go elsewhere. In this case, we were able to have the embargo lift impact of the automotive group that would have been in that room um, through work in advance. And then what we saw instead, or in addition to, was this great dialogue with, with our customers. We had 80,000 people actually watch the reveal of the car, um, which was fantastic. And then we saw that number um, more than double um, for the Kate Hudson film. And the way that, that continues to live and permeate in various places is very cool to me. Um, and just this opportunity to start the messaging um, instead of going through the third party um, of an influencer or a media person, though I very much value how important that is, it gave me an opportunity to speak directly to a potential future customer. And I think we've seen that in the response of, of not just viewership and engagement, um, but also in the reactions to the reservation programs and the demand for the car well before it ever showed up in, in a dealership. And then I think the other thing that has been super interesting as a, as a learning for me is the integration with our marketing team. Um, we didn't do this as a PR effort in a silo and marketing separate, which I know in your among your audience may not seem like that revolutionary thing, but in automotive, those two silos, ne'er they ever come together, you know? <laughs> So we did it together. Um, and what was cool from QX55, we had a hashtag and a theme, it was our uh, demand stage for that launch. And um, we had it for all the PR materials through the launch of the first drive of the car, and then it stopped. And then the ads began and they had a different theme. Uh, with QX60, we're like, that shouldn't be the case. We need to set a message for this car and it needs to go all the way through. 
And so it's been really neat to see Conquer Life and Style start as a PR effort at the beginning, a key message about the car that permeated how we did the reveal for the drive program. And it will be absolutely a, a through line all the way through the ad campaign and traditional marketing. Oh, and that the power of that to me is really um, an impact that I think will last for a while for, for me in particular. Yes, yes. And, and, and Stephanie, we're, we're, we're going we're to close with you and your, and, and your learnings. But I, I want to just respond to something Wendy said about integration. Yes, in theory, everybody's on board with integration and integrating with marketing in practice. I mean, it, it yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on the organization, right? And how integrated the organization is. And, and we've seen, we've seen examples of, of all and, and I love that you were confident in, in going direct to the consumer, because you know, in this new, you know, we, we define public relations quite broadly. We think public means your public. So that's all your stakeholders, including consumers. And that as a discipline, we should be able to reach out to, to all, all stakeholders. But so often I feel like we confine ourselves to media and maybe influencers and, you know, as well, but, but I, I love that you were, you, you kind of went there and you went boldly and you did it in concert with marketing, which is quite, quite remarkable. Cause sometimes that's, you know, it's read the turf war start, right? Like who, yeah. who gets to talk directly to the customer? Um, so Stephanie, what about you from your end? What was, what were the learnings? Well, I definitely think, um, what we learned and what we want to continue to do is be bold with our storytelling. We don't need to stay in our lane that we have a right as a brand to tell stories that live outside of auto media only. And if anything, the QX60 launch really showed us that, that we have a big right to win there. And we have a value and a proposition and a product that can tell many different types of stories. I think also we really learned that like editor is being redefined and we editors come in all shapes and sizes these days and that and again I maybe that doesn't sound super revolutionary but really the rise of the edit fluencer the editor that is a content creator and giving them a palette to do that is so critical especially when you have a product that is so experiential like a car that you can drive and you can touch and be in it's critical that we make room for all those different type of journalists and give them seats at the table um, so that they can really create those stories. And I think finally is that honestly, talk with your consumer. Stop talking at them. We talked with them during these launches. We brought them in. We made them the focus, not what, you know, bean counters wanted to see. And it's paying off because it really positioned our brand so much differently than our competitors that now we have a roadmap on how we have a right to win in this modern world. I think this is one of the key things you said. It's a redefine. Everything is being re redefined right now, and this is such a great opportunity. You all are obviously seizing that everything is being rewritten. The rules are being rewritten. So you know, don't 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 try to put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? Like go go with go with the change. And I also learned a new word: edit 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 influencer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Wendy loves that my favorite pastime is making up words, um, edit fluencer. So edit, edit fluencer, okay. Exactly, so editors are actually becoming big influencers and have influential spheres that, um, and they are content creators. They are not just writers, they're not just journalists. And so we wanted to give them a lot of room to be part of our brand, to tell our story. And we were able to do that with our Ride and Drive um, program um, with the QX60 launch and a big part of how we wanna move forward as we think about what does a win in earned look like? And it looks like many different things these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Well. Well, this was this was a, a lively conversation. What an interesting launch! Like I said, we will put links in the show notes for those of you that want more information, um, including to the films um, that were referenced in the conversation. Um, and Wendy and Stephanie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for talking about this and for coming on coming on the show. Thank, thank you for having you. us. Yes, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Provoke Media Podcast.